and I have also given, hopefully everybody has it, the handout um, <clears throat> that we'll be using. We'll be using it tonight, but also in the weeks ahead. And uh, not necessary, you don't have to have it, but uh, it might help you kind of see where we're going in this particular chapter of uh, the book of Hebrews. And before we get started, I don't know if you are like me, but sometimes when I try to do something or follow after something, I like to have an example before me. So if I'm going to make something or do something, whatever the case may be, sometimes I like to have an example. Do you ever like to do that? You have to like, it's nice to have an example that you can follow after. And uh, I thought about that as I was preparing this a while back because tonight we're going to start Hebrews 11. And uh, if many of you know me, I typically don't, I usually start at the beginning of a book and go to an end. But Hebrews 11 is the interesting, and I've titled the study, if you notice, Examples of the Life of Faith. Sometimes it's called the Hall of Faith, the Heroes of Faith, those sorts of <clears throat> various ways to say the same thing. But essentially what we'll be looking at, and it really will be more introductory this week, but in the coming weeks, and you can just by looking at the handout, which I'm going to review it in a second, basically what the author does is he gives examples of men and women who were, of course, Old Testament patriarchs and those sorts of things, uh, Old Testament saints, those who trusted and lived by faith. And so it's an example of a variety of people who lived uh, their lives out, lived out their faith. And uh, so we'll be in there for the next many weeks as we go through it. And uh, But before we actually look at the text tonight, like I said, tonight's going to mostly be introductory, and then next week we'll move into the heroes, in other words, the examples. But uh, it always is good to kind of get our bearings, and so that's what I'm going to do tonight. Now, if you take your handout and just look at it, like I said, you don't have to have it to do the study, but it'll kind of give you an idea of what we'll be looking at, and then kind of where the author was at, why he wrote this chapter, because the chapter is unique. You can study the chapter like we're doing independent of the entire book. Of course, obviously, you can teach it in the context of the book, um, meaning verse by verse through the whole book. But basically, basically what we'll do tonight is I'm going to give some basic information, some introductory information, why he wrote it, the chapter that is. And then if you notice, verses 1 and th through 3 kind of give us the characteristics of faith. But then, if you follow along in verses 4 through the end of the chapter, you'll notice he gives examples of faith before the patriarchs. Okay, This is just sort of an overview. And then he gives examples of the father of faith, which would be Abraham. And then he gives examples of faith that continued during the patriarchal period. He'll give us an example of the faith of Moses faith that was exhibited at Jericho, and then just sort of a general overview from 32 to 40 of people of faith. So this is uh, an overview, if you will, in some ways of a lot of the Old Testament as well, so it, it serves as a refresher there as well. So that's what we'll be looking at in the coming weeks, but before we look at it, it would probably be helpful to say, why did the author include the chapter? Because that is helpful in understanding it. Now, you can read the chapter, and the chapter would be one of reading a very brief summary of these individuals' lives. Now, these are not character studies, and I'm going to mention this throughout the time. These aren't character studies in the way we might think, but they give us examples of people who lived out their life of faith. So before we start, though, let me give you an overview or an outline, rather, of Hebrews. Okay? And you don't have to go back and read this, but if you wanted to or do study on it. But I want you to understand why the author includes chapter 11. So if you were to read Hebrews, essentially what you'd come away with is Jesus is better than everything. Okay? In chapters 1 through 4, you have the superiority of Christ in terms of his person. And, and there's other ways to say this. But in chapters 1 through 4, if you read it, and you're welcome to read it over the next coming weeks, and it'll fill in some of this. I like to think of it as the superiority of Christ in terms of his person. So, for example, he's better than the angels, for example. If you then go to chapters 5 through 7, you have the superiority of Christ in terms of his priesthood. 
So there the author would say he's better than Aaron, he's better than Moses. Okay? You kind of get the idea of what the author is doing. The author is saying that Jesus is superior in terms of his person, better than angels, better than the priesthood. And then in chapters 8 through 10, the superiority of Christ in terms of sacrifice. Whereas the sacrifices, and you can think of this, in the Old Testament, the sacrifices, they were temporary. They were good, but they were temporary, and they were not final. You had to perpetually give them. And in chapter 8 through 10, you can see where the sacrifice of Jesus was once and all, once for all. It was final, and it was the final sacrifice. So that's sort of a, a broad way of looking at it. Chapter 11, chapters 11 through 13 or sort of practical exhortations. In other words, the so what. It would be sort of the application. In many ways, it's similar to Paul, the way he does things like Ephesians, for instance, where he says, here's the body of truth, and here's what you should do with it. And that's sort of the idea here. If you look at uh, a summary of Hebrews, basically what you're going to have is the author is writing to a group of individuals who are being tested in their faith, and they are thinking of maybe we should return back to what we believed before. In other words, maybe we should go back to, in this case, uh, the Jewish heritage. Maybe we should go back to those types of things. And what the author is saying in those ten chapters is, why in the world would you do that when Jesus is better than all of them? And that's my way of saying it. Why, why would you go back to the old sacrificial system when Jesus offered a perfect sacrifice. So that's sort of my way of, of saying it in brief. And so what he's going to do is to help them and to encourage them. And the way he encourages them is he says, here is this slate of individuals from the Old Testament who lived by faith. They had perseverance, they had endurance, and those sorts of things. And so chapter 11 is really a chapter to encourage them to live out their faith, endurance, and so forth. Um, I want you to look with me at chapter 12, because chapter 12 obviously follows chapter 11, and chapter 11 is what we're going to be looking at. But you probably recognize these verses, but if, for instance, you get to the end of chapter 11, it says in chapter 12, verse 1, notice, therefore... So as a result of giving you all of these witnesses, notice what he says, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, who would the witnesses be? The aforementioned, or chapter 11, whichever way you want to say it. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, or have that, excuse me, surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance, encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. But notice, let us run with endurance that is the race that is set before us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, and so forth. So if you just kind of think about it, he said, why would you go back to that old faith? Why would you, in other words, leave the faith that is better, Jesus and so forth, hear of individuals who endured in faith, and then he's going to say in chapter 12, you notice, Fix your eyes on Jesus and run the race. So uh, let me read this to you, and then we'll read our text for tonight, verses 1 through 3 of Hebrews 11. Thomas Constable says, The writer encouraged his readers in chapter 11 by reminding them of the faithful perseverance of selected Old Testament saints. And that's just a simple way to say it. Let me read it again. The writer encouraged his readers... In chapter 11, by reminding them of the faithful perseverance of selected Old Testament saints. So he's giving them examples of Old Testament saints who lived a life of faith, who gave evidence of it and those sorts of things. And by following their, their examples, they can run the race that is set before them. So that would be a way to, to think of it. So as we go through the chapter, and I'll try to remind you of this, they're not character studies in the sense that we might normally think of it, but they, of course, uh, do give us a good overview of some Old Testament uh, individuals. But one of the things I notice about these is all these individuals, they not only knew God, they walked with Him, and they all had a very intimate relationship with Him. And you'll see that. Uh, and they're all different, too. They're all very different and uh, all very unique. And there's some uh, unique 
people in here that we might not think as well. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Uh, would someone want to read, and like I said, this is largely introductory um, for tonight, and then we'll get into the individuals and the examples, but would someone want to read Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, that which kind of sets the stage? Uh, would anyone want to read that, or I can? Yeah, go ahead, Dortha. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. All right. Thank you, Dortha. So there's the text that we'll look at tonight. Now, let's just start off, and I'm going to go through each of these verses and uh, comment on them, and, uh, and then I'll kind of set the stage for showing you the structure of it, uh, of, the, of the chapter, uh, which becomes self-explanatory once we get to verse 3. So the first thing you'll notice in verse 1 is this is not a definition so much as it's a description of faith, okay? So that's the best way to think of it is verse 1 gives us a description of faith as opposed to a definition, if that makes sense. It's describing, in other words, sort of what faith looks like. Uh, and, of course, that's what the chapter is going to do too, isn't it? It's going to show us, for instance, how did Abel show his faith? How was it lived out? Those sorts of things. And so it's better to see it as the description of faith, if you will, rather than a definition. When I say that, a definition would be faith is this, and this is really more of a uh, description. You could maybe even say the characteristics, um, and we'll see characteristics as we go through this, of what does it look like to live out faith. Now, you'll notice when Dortha read that, you'll see it says, now faith is the, let's look at this word here, uh, either assurance or substance, okay? Now, those, that's typically how that word is translated. It's a Greek word that, of course, means assurance. Uh, it also can be meaning substance. But it has the meaning of supporting something or giving confidence to something. The last one is the one that's helpful to give confidence of. I mean, the supporting does too. Don't get me wrong. So in other words, supporting, you know, if you have a building, you have something that supports it. Uh, and this is sort of the idea. It says faith is the assurance it's the substance. Uh, it, the Greek word has the idea of confidence. Okay, So if you were to take it and read it with that, you would say, now faith is the confidence, i.e. the substance or the assurance of things hoped for. Now, when you think of the word hope, of course, we end up with sort of, and I know I'm sort of generalizing this, but when we think of hope, we have basically two ways of generally seeing it, isn't it? Usually hope from the world standpoint, if you were to Google, what does hope mean? You're probably going to find some sort of wishy-washy, well, I hope this happens, right? More like luck. Yeah, they would have that sort of almost superstition type. It could, that type of thing. I hope, for instance, the Carolina Panthers make the playoffs. But in reality, that would be wishful thinking, wouldn't it? be almost like I was actually going to um, give Darl a hard time. It would be like saying, I hope the Green Bay Packers make it, but probably don't have a lot of confidence, right? Well, the church, the oldest, that's when it comes to the yeah, right. So when we look at this, we need to understand, though, we can't look at these words always the way that the natural man would. In other words, the world itself does. So biblical hope isn't wishful thinking, is it? It's complete confidence, notice why I was emphasizing that word before, it's confidence in thing, something. Now, I'm going to read this definition to you, and we can explore this a little bit, but in the Ryrie Study Bible, he makes uh, this statement. He says, faith gives reality and proof of things unseen, but notice the ending part of this. He says, treating them as if they were already objects of sight rather than hope. Do you understand what he's saying there? So we live by faith and confidence and assurance in the things that God has promised and revealed to us, but where? In the Word of God. Say that again. Could you read that? Yeah, sure. So in the Ryrie Study Bible says, Faith gives reality and proof of things unseen. But you notice in particular he says, Treating them as if they were already objects of sight rather than of hope. So the idea there is you and I live as believers, or we should. We should live in confidence uh, 
and expectation that the things that God has promised and revealed to us will come true, right? We don't live as though, for instance, well, I hope Jesus will return, right? I hope that he will put an end to all sin. I hope. No, we have assurance because of what? We believe what the Bible says and we believe God's promises. And so we live with a sort of, if you will, confidence. I think it's the idea of having confidence, but the confidence isn't in anything other than the scripture. Does that make sense? Uh, When we pray, and I was thinking earlier when Gary was praying, so it fits so well, because we hope, right? but not hope like the world. We, we don't have this sort of, well, I hope one day I'll see those who are in Christ again. No, we know at the rapture of the church, what happens? We will, of course, be caught up together with him along with those who have died in Christ. You can go on and on and on. We live with the hope, in other words, the confidence that God's going to fulfill everything. God hasn't fulfilled everything in his word yet, has he? But will he? The answer would be yes, but some of that is because why? I think prophecy is, a, is probably one of the best ones in many ways. I'm not suggesting there are other ones. God fulfilled all of those promises related to the birth of Jesus. Do you not think he's going to fulfill the rest? So it's, it's that sort of idea. We're confident, but the confidence is in the word of God. Uh, and that's the way I like to think of it, what God has revealed to us. But uh, So let's go back and look at this, read it again. Uh, now faith is the assurance, it's the certainty, it's the confidence of things hoped for. But notice, this was kind of what Ryrie was getting at. It's the conviction of things not yet. In other words, we haven't seen them yet, right? We haven't seen the second coming of Jesus. We haven't seen the rapture, whatever the case may be. But we have confidence works is you got to see it to believe it. Right, but of course the Bible is just the opposite, isn't it? One of the things I will tell you with this too is if you notice as we go through and there is a verse in there and it'll state in there that they lived without ever actually receiving that. Mm-hmm. Do you know? So they lived with that sort of... Did you have something to do with that? I didn't want to interrupt I just, you. I, I, I didn't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. Yeah, and that's sort of the idea. You know, it can doesn't have to be, to your point, it could be something, I say practical, meaning, and I, you don't need to tell me what it was, but it could be something that was in the immediate. In other words, we receive it quickly. It could also be something afar, meaning you haven't received it yet. And that's one of the things you'll notice in here is that the author will say at one point, they lived, they died without receiving it, yet they still had hope in it, which we'll get to later. Uh, let's go on here to number two here, or the second verse here. Uh, the men of old. Now, make sure you don't misunderstand me. I did not say old men, okay? All right. Um, yeah, I know. People of the past, thank you for saving me there, Dortha. But uh, you'll notice here, so as we go forward, we've kind of explained verse 1. And all of this is sort of setting the stage, I think, really for verse 3, which will prompt us into the characters, the individuals. But notice verse 2, it says, for by it. What is the it? It's what we just talked about. So that type of faith, notice, the men of old gained approval. So I like to think of verse 2 as a summary statement. That's just my way of saying it. Is sort of a summary statement. He's saying, in effect, these men of old, these, if you will, patriarchs, and all of these people that we're going to go through over the coming weeks in chapter 11, they live their lives giving examples of that type of description of faith, and they gained approval. Uh, the New American Standard uses that. Uh, it's interesting, though, if you look at that, phrase there, gained approval. Uh, Actually, I think the New King James is more helpful here. It says they gained a good testimony. You can also use the word witness. Does that make sense? So gained approval is fine. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Um, But it gives the idea of they gained a good testimony. Uh, That's the way the New King James translates it. Uh, It could also give the idea of witness. Okay. So if you see it again, for by it, meaning the aforementioned description of faith, uh, 
the men of old, meaning those individuals will look at, meaning men and women, they gained approval. In other words, they gave a good testimony. They gave a witness to their faith. That's what, Terry, you were describing sort of. And Dortha, they gave evidence. They showed what they believed, even though they weren't going to always receive it right away. And so I like to think of it, I put it this way, their lives bore witness to the faith they had. But, of course, that asks us the question, do we do that, right? Do, do we give evidence? Do we give a good testimony, a good witness to the world? Think of it this way. When you and I go through a difficult time, what sort of example, in other words, do we give out to the world? Do we show that we believe what God says in his word? Or do we act just like the world? And that's just one way of looking at it. But uh, so the, verse 2 is really just sort of a summary statement. That's the way I put it. It's summarizing sort of what we're going to see. We're going to see examples of, of course, men and women here in the rest of the chapter who gave good witness. They gave a good testimony. What was the testimony of their faith? It was their life, right? It was the way they lived out the, the faith and such. Um, but, of course, all of this is setting us up for what I think sort of transitions it uniquely is verse 3. Verse 3, to me, is one of the most interesting in the chapter, and it begins to set the structure. When Dorotha read it, you'll notice it uses the phrase, and this is the first time, and I want to show you the structure of the chapter. It's, it's pretty simple. If you like to underline things or highlight them, you'll see the structure of the whole, the whole chapter. Notice what does it say, by faith. That's the expression. That f- phrase is repeated over and over again. And that's sort of how the chapter is structured. Look at verse 4. By faith whom? Abel. Verse 5. By faith Enoch. Verse 7. By faith Noah. Verse 8. By faith Abraham. And so the ladies don't get mad at me. Verse 11. By faith even Sarah etc., etc. So if you were to go through and underline by faith, you'd see the structure of how the book is. And uh, that's just something for you to take note of. Um, I'm going to read something to you, and then we're going to look at this verse 3. I, I, I love verse 3. I think verse 3 is uh, interesting because so far when we look at faith, we've looked at faith really sort of, I would say, in the present, meaning in the moment, as well as in the future. But verse 3 is going to sort of flip this on its axis, and it goes all the way back to when? Creation. Creation. I want to read something for you. Uh, Homer Kent has a commentary on Hebrews, and he makes this statement. It's a little lengthy, but I want you to listen to it. Then let's look at the verse. He says, quote, The author reminds his readers that faith is absolutely necessary if we are to understand even the first page of Scripture. No man was present at creation. Mankind is confronted with the universe already existing. Genesis provides the explanation. This is to be accepted by faith, for there were no human spectators. I I love the quote because in many ways that's so true, isn't it? Uh, And that's what I want you to kind of get around your head. And so he says, basically, look, you have to have faith even at the very beginning of the book of the Bible, don't you? Because, I mean, has anybody, was anybody, anybody, maybe I'm wrong, were any of you there at the beginning of creation? (laughs) What about all of these people who today and how the world has shifted from taking Genesis, even in the church, as an actual historical record? I actually think they have a problem with verse 3 because you'll notice what he's saying here. But let's look at the verse. So um, I'm going to read it again. I know Dorothy read it a few minutes ago. But let's read it again. Notice this is the first by faith statement, but he sets it based off of the account of creation in Genesis. Let's read it real quick. So by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are invisible. So the first thing you'll see here is by faith, what is he basically proposing? Well, And you could do this in a couple of different orders. The first thing is that God is the one who created everything. I can tell you this for certainty. If you are ever to test somebody in the way they view the Bible, all you have to do is ask them to give you an overview of what they believe of Genesis 1 
2 and 3. Probably Genesis 1 would suffice. Because what you'll find out is people that do basically gymnastics with the Bible will distort it. Or you'll have someone who says, you know what, I wasn't there. I trust what God says is true. How did he do it? I don't know other than what he described there. I take him by faith. I I take the account as an actual record of historical faith. And that's the way I read it. I'm not saying that I'm better than someone else. I'm just simply saying if you start off the Bible and you already by faith have said, I don't believe it, how are you going to believe the rest of the Scripture? And, and in many ways, you can't. And you notice here he's not arguing over the lengths of days, even though I have my own view on that, which is that it's just an actual day. I don't see any reason to read Yom any way different. But the point Kent makes, I think, is great. No one was there at creation. Even the most arrogant person who believes in evolution, they weren't there. They have no idea. And I think he's right. Mankind is confronted with basically one of two options. Theory or God's revelation? There is no in-between. But let's look here. So, by faith, what does the author say? He says, we take it that God created everything. Let's look at a couple of passages. Um, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. Um, Because it is true, the way you read Genesis, in particular the first, I really think it's the first three chapters, but you can pretty much tell where someone's going to end. But let's, in their view of the Bible at least, but uh, let's read Hebrews uh, verse 2. I think I'll just read verse 1 to help it flow a little better. So, God, after he spoke long ago to the prophet, excuse me, to the fathers and the prophets in many portions in many ways, but notice verse 2, in these last days has spoke, spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So Jesus is obviously being brought in there as I call it the agent of creation. That's somehow sometimes the way people will refer to it. Now in John 1, 3, what does it say there as well? Let's look and see. Somebody want to read John 1, 3 for me? Close. Yep. Yeah, so so um Yeah, so let's read so all so John one three says all things came into being through him. This is the Logos we know to be Christ. It says all things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. So that right there along with Hebrews, we're taking by faith that before there was anything there was God, and he spoke and brought forth everything. Now, were you there when he did that? Well, obviously, so what is the author of Hebrews saying? You have to, to some degree, take that by faith, right? So we have to take that by some degree of faith. Um, You don't have to turn back to Hebrews 11 um, because we're going to go somewhere else. But you'll notice, so it says, by faith, we understand that God basically created everything, and he used the word of God. He he spoke creation forward. That would be Genesis 1. But I want us to look at some different ones because I don't want us to always go to Genesis 1. And I'm obviously standing on Genesis 1, but we probably know that one, Hebrews and John. Uh, But I want us to look at Psalm 33. And what I'm trying to show you here is that if you go from Genesis and even in the poetic books and, of course, in John... And then we'll see, of course, we've already looked at uh, Hebrews, but uh, Psalm 33, and I'll just read these real quick. Psalm 33, and if you're taking notes, this is verse 6 and 9 that I'm reading. Uh, And this is basically a praise psalm, but it's praising God as the preserver of that which he created. So this doesn't it sound very similar to the New Testament, right? It gives a lot of echoes of like Colossians 1, for instance. But uh, Psalm 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, mouth, (laughs) mouth, all all their host. Verse 9, For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, 
and it stood fast or stood forth, brought forth. I mean, right there you see, if you take Genesis and you don't actually take it as God creating anything uh, in terms of the evolutionist, what do you do when you get here? God brought forth all of creation, all that exists, and of course he's speaking here of the word here. And when God spoke, verse 9, I love it, when God spoke, what happens? It's done. Now when Jesus heals, what does he do? He speaks, and then there's a long period of recovery, and you have to go, no. There's no surgery. There's no anything. What is Jesus showing us? Jesus shows us that same idea, doesn't he, when many of those healings. Jesus speaks, and it's done. So he shows himself in many ways to be God as well. So we've looked at Hebrews 1, 2, John 1, 3, of course, I'm not minimizing Genesis 1, but we probably all know that. Psalm 33, verse 6 and verse 9. But let's look at one other one, and then we'll look at the word worlds. But uh, 2 Peter 3, 5. I'm trying to show you a varied list of things that show us that God is the creator, and he used what I call the agent of creation, the Logos, which is Christ. That is part of Christ's uh, work if you will. That is one of the things he did. I mean, he brought forth creation. Um, so forth. But let's look here at 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3.5. Someone want to read 2 Peter 3.5 for me? Dave, you got it? Oh, okay. Do you want me to read it? You want to read it? Go ahead, Terry. Go ahead. For when they maintain this, it escapes the notice that by the word of, the, of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Okay. So there again, you still see, in, in, I know it's in brief there, but you see there that, uh, that the word of God was used, of course, in bringing forth that which is existing. So what do you see there? You see from Genesis, Psalms, John, Hebrews, and Second Peter what? God is the creator. God used Jesus, the Logos, his agent of creation, and he brought forth and created everything. Again, what the author of Hebrews is doing in verse 3 is simply putting it this way, sort of like what Kent was saying. Nobody was there in Genesis, meaning the account of the creation week. We take by faith what God says, and then, of course, we go through the rest of the scriptures and we begin to take it by faith. I would I'll tell it to you this way. If you don't take Genesis 1 as an actual account, you pretty much are in trouble the rest of the way of the Bible because you can't reconcile the rest of the scripture. But let's go back here to Hebrews 11.3, and I'm going to look at this word worlds because um, not for any controversial reason, but just... Uh, in case someone is curious about it, but uh, Hebrews 11.3, uh, if you notice when I read it, or Dorotha when she read it, it says, by faith we understand that the worlds, uh, and some translations will use the word ages, this is a Greek word, if you're curious, it's aeon, it's A-I-O-N, it means ages, time, or eons of time, in other words, it's everything. So God, when he brought forth, he brought forth, Everything. God is the one who brings forth everything. That's exactly what you see in John 1 3, isn't it? That when Jesus brought into creation, he brought into creation, if you will, everything. Uh, and so there's nothing that is outside of that. Uh, but if you know. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Say that again. There's a perversion of that the Son of the too. I'm sure they pervert everything the there. means that there's other worlds. Yeah, yeah. it's funny, though, because the word itself doesn't mean that. It just means ages, eons of time. It brings, yeah. But the funny thing with that, I will tell you, you know, and I'm not trying to be sarcastic, is not only does the word not actually mean that, but that's actually, in fact, what John 1, 3 would say, is that, well, he brought into creation everything, you know. Yeah, so, but uh, I want to draw your attention, and then we'll look to finish up in a second here. But you'll notice he says, uh, so by faith we understand that God is the one who brought forth creation. He used the word of God. We would think of it 
theologically the Logos Jesus as the agent there. But notice that the ending of it is kind of interesting how it plays into this seen and not seen of verse 1. He says, so that what is seen was not made out of that which was visible. That, to me, gives the idea of God taking and creating out of nothing, which is what the Jews, does anybody know what the Jews call that? Ex- Helio, helio, but yeah. So it's the idea that before there was anything, if you have a trouble going to sleep tonight, rewind back to where there was nothing. But then God existed in three persons, and he willed and spoke forth everything. Now, how do we know that? Well, by faith. We believe what God's word says, and we have confidence in it. But uh, I do hope that we will sincerely take how we read Genesis 1, because look, beloved, if you read Genesis 1 as a fictional story or mythology, you really can't handle the rest of the Bible. You might as well lay it aside, because you can't reconcile the rest of it, I don't think, very well. Uh, Before we finish, and I'll see if you have any questions, um, two things. Him... Number 727, you don't have to turn there because don't worry, I'm not going to sing, deep breath. But I want to read the, the, one of the stanzas here, I think it was interesting, I came across it, it says, Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Do you notice the assurance, the confidence there? They have the, that's sort of the idea I was trying to get across. The confidence, the certainty is that we know that what God promises he will deliver because we believe what God's word says. It's not really that difficult. However, of course, you throw in those people that don't believe the Bible, what do they have? Wishful thinking, right? So you either have wishful thinking or you have assurance, and the assurance is uh, scripture. Um, If you did want to read next week, or for what we'll look at next week, you'll notice verse 4, by faith. So this is when he starts giving the examples of people who have lived out Uh, in particular verses 1 and 2 by faith Abel, by faith Enoch and then by faith Noah and so we'll look at that next week Lord willing but uh, anybody have any comments or questions